Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So today we look at communion. There's a famous uh, teacher in the church who described uh, baptism and communion as visible words of God's grace. In other words, God makes his word, the gospel word, visible in the water and the bread and the wine. They are visible ways of saying something about our human nature and how we live in the world and how we come to believe in God. That believing is not so much a thing that we do in our head where I just simply say these principles are true and that's it. But rather faith is also a matter of the heart. It's about trusting and receiving that these promises are true for me. It's one thing to talk about God's grace and forgiveness and I can say, well, I believe that such things are true. But it's another thing to talk about grace and to say, it is true for me. It's one thing to say that God loved the whole world, but it's another thing to recognize that we might have that wondering, well, maybe God loves that person or that person or the one next to me, but I'm not so sure. If God knew who I was and what I had done, would God love me? So how do we come to an assurance of faith? In baptism, God breaks through all the abstractions, all the theories, and he makes a welcome and a word of grace that is personal, individual, and specific. And faith says, yes, I felt the water. Faith says, yes, I heard the word. Faith says, yes, God's grace, it is for me. And no one can take that away. Communion works in the same way. It makes God's word of forgiveness visible in the bread and the wine along with that promise. It's something touchable, something I can receive again and again. Luther understood that we live our lives in the body. And we experience the truth of, of the things in the body. Now what do I mean by that? For example, you might uh, have experienced conflict in your life. Maybe an argument in the family or uh, an argument with a dear friend. It's one thing for say, be somebody to give you a book that talks about uh, theories or understandings of forgiveness. But it's something all together different to sit down to a meal of reconciliation with someone you have disappointed. God makes his word of promise visible in the bread and the wine that we might be brought into a relationship of trust and that that relationship might be sustained week in and week out in our lives. For us to know that his word for us is meant to be a word that feeds us, body and soul, that Jesus is for me, that this forgiveness is for me, and that that's important. So we might ask, well, why is it that we celebrate communion every week? You know, some of us might remember, well, I remember, Pastor, we used to do it once a month, or in fact, I remember we used to do it once a quarter. Why so often? In part, what we do is we remember that the pattern of Christians when they gathered was to worship meant to celebrate a meal. That's what Paul is talking about in that reading from 1 Corinthians where the church gathered and they ate. And they did that because they remembered what Jesus did with them just before the cross. But Luther understood there's another reason we do this as well. And it has to do with our soul and what it means to be human and to recognize that we are dependent on God's grace. That my faith is not so much something that I bring to the relationship. Is my faith is something that God uses so that I might receive what God brings to the relationship. That we hunger for the kind of life where our brokenness is healed. We hunger for our sin to be forgiven. We hunger for an awareness or an assurance that my destiny, even in the face of death, is assured. Faith recognizes that in some basic way, we are all beggars and we are never more. That we are not in control of these things that are so important for us. That faith, it has to be that daily act of trust where I receive the gift that God has for me. So we gather here at this visible assurance of grace in the meal, in the supper. 
And God offers us and we do this regularly so that we might be encouraged and strengthened in faith. So I want to turn to uh, Luther's teaching and you've got to insert in your bulletin a little tan one I believe inside your bulletin. We're not going to look at all of it uh, but it's there uh, for you to take home. You know, catechism is just a fancy old-time word for teaching. And put, uh, Luther put together a small book of teaching uh, to be taken home uh, for families. And it talks about sort of the basics of the faith. In other words, how shall I live? The Ten Commandments. What shall I believe? The Creed. How shall I pray? The Lord's Prayer. And how do I know that I have God's grace, baptism, the Lord's Supper, confession, and forgiveness? That book of teaching is not sort of a summary of the Christian life, but I, I think of it also as sort of a, a guidebook in terms of how to read the Bible, what to focus on, and how to understand the story of God's grace in the scriptures. Today we're going to look at the, small, uh, at the Lord's Supper. And if you look at the top, Luther asks a simple question. He says, well, what is the sacrament of the altar? And then he says, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and the wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. I think one way of trying to understand what Luther is talking about here is to ask a question. And the question is this, where is Jesus in the meal? Where is Jesus when we come forward for communion? There were two answers to that question which Luther said uh, felt they were inadequate, they were not helpful to understand where Jesus is in the supper. One of the answers to, to the question of where is Jesus was to say that Jesus was under the control of the church that it was when the church uh, instituted the communion correctly that then God's grace was made available to us all. That when the pastor or the priest said the right words in the right way, then that act turned the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Jesus and he was there and I could have them. In other words, in a way, the institution was under, the, uh, the supper was under the control of the institution and for God's forgiveness was sort of under the control of those who offered it. You think about in the time there was a practice called indulgence. And indulgence was something where you could off, make, pay an offering and in that offering then you would receive the assurance not only that your sins were forgiven but somebody else's was as well. The question is, or the challenge was, is that, that if you didn't pay, then you couldn't play. That if you didn't pay, maybe God's grace and forgiveness was not for you. There were two consequences to this sort of institutional understanding of grace and where Jesus was. One, there was a sort of climate of fear and uncertainty. Because if grace was under the control of an institution, a human institution, then it was very uncertain. But the second thing to do with it is that if grace was under the control of an institution, then it didn't matter how I received it. I mean, if I simply went up and I got the goods, then all was fine, and it didn't matter how I lived. That my life did not have to be about repentance or faith or a life of following Jesus. In other words, what we could say is I'm forgiven on Monday, I'm, I'm forgiven on Sunday, who cares about Monday? So Luther went back to the scriptures and he said this, forgiveness belongs to God and that forgiveness is freely given to all of us. That's why he called it the meal of the Lord's Supper because Jesus started the meal and Jesus offered himself in the meal. That God's grace is freely given and it's given so that I might simply receive it freely in faith and that my life then might be freed to live the kind of life God intended for all of us. There is a second answer to the question of where is Jesus in the meal? And the, and the answer had to do something like this. It is not possible when you come forward and you get the bread and the wine that Jesus is somehow uh, magically present in the bread and the wine. 
It's all symbolic. In fact, Jesus is in heaven. I'm down here on earth. And the only way in which I'm going to have Jesus is in my faith and trust. And in my faith, I believe uh, in Jesus. And in that way, I have fellowship with Jesus. That what we do here is just sort of a symbolic give and take. But it's my faith that makes it real. Luther wondered whether that was going to be really of any help to us. Because if God's grace becomes dependent on my faith, then when the chips are down, when I am uncertain about life, when I experience a deep kind of spiritual need, I will find that my faith is never strong enough, never good enough, never right enough, and Jesus will always seem far away. Ultimately, he said, you know, we can make faith itself into a kind of works, a works righteousness. In other words, the quality of my faith or the work of my faith becomes sort of the, the gateway as to whether I get Jesus or not. So what does Luther do? He goes back to the words. He goes back to the Bible. And he takes them at sort of faith's value. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, it is for you for forgiveness. And in communion, he said, we have the real presence of Jesus in the bread and the wine with the promise. It's not, he didn't come up with any kind of fancy theory about how this happened. He just simply said, Jesus says, here I am for you, for now, for grace, for life. When we come forward for communion, when we put out our hand, and when we receive the bread and the wine, and when we take it in and chew and swallow, and when we hear those words of promise, this is me for you. What we do is we receive Jesus, and we receive him as the gift he is meant to be. We take Jesus into our bodies, into our lives, so that we might be renewed and refreshed. Maybe there's another way of thinking about this. And it is that in the Lord's Supper, what we learn is that God is not a distant God. That God is not simply a watchmaker or an engineer who started the earth going and made the, created this complex and wonderful device and then sits in the heaven and watches the rest of us play out our parts. But rather God is personal and present. That he came in the incarnation of Jesus, God in the flesh. And a God comes to us again and again in the suffer, offering forgiveness, grace, communion. That's why Luther kept emphasizing the words, for you. Because the point of it all is that God might create a life of faith and trust. A life free to be what God had always made us to be. To help us think about this, I invite you to take out your red hymn book. And we're going to turn to hymn number 770. We're not going to sing it, but I just want you to uh, look at this familiar hymn. 770, Give Me Jesus. Now that hymn was not written by Martin Luther. And that hymn was not about communion. But both could be true. Because when we come for communion, we always come for Jesus. When we come for communion, we do not come for some kind of theory of transubstantiation, but rather we say, give me Jesus. We do not come to remember something that happened a long time ago so that communion can only be a kind of mental or spiritual exercise. When we come forward, we're saying, give me Jesus. We don't come in order to show that somehow my faith is good or great. But we come with the recognition that we need and we say, give me Jesus. There is something simple and straightforward about coming forward. Putting out my hand and hearing the words, this is Jesus for me, for forgiveness. I remember a survey years ago when I was a young pastor and the question was when did you experience God's grace in worship? There were a couple of people who mentioned the confession and forgiveness, some others talked about music, a couple talked about the sermon, most talked about communion. And when I was a young pastor I thought, what? So few responses about the sermon? <laughs> but now I see. <laughs> 
God's grace and forgiveness, it is made personal and visible in the bread and the wine and the promise. And it is the main act. Everything else is preamble or preparation, even the sermon, in order to receive the heart of the gospel, that is, the forgiveness of sins. You know, it's like the song says, you can have all the rest, but give me Jesus. Amen.